With just six months until Election Day, developments in lower Manhattan and the Middle East could have a major impact on the presidential race here at home. In New York, adult film actor Stormy Daniels took the stand in former President Donald Trump's criminal trial. Today, the judge denied Trump's request for a mistrial based on her testimony. Daniels received $130,000 in 2016 in exchange for her silence about an alleged sexual encounter with Trump. He is accused of falsifying business records to try and cover up those payments. This was a very big day. A very revealing day. As you see, their case is totally falling apart. They have nothing on books and records, and even something that should bear very little relationship to the case. Uh, it's just a disaster. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, Israel sent tanks into Rafah and has taken control of the Gazan side of a key border crossing to Egypt. The move comes just hours after the Israeli government rejected a ceasefire proposal backed by Hamas. Ed O'Keefe is at the White House with more on the Biden administration's opposition to that operation in Rafa. But we're going to start with Errol Barnett in lower Manhattan. Errol, I'm so glad we have you now because everyone wants to know what did Stormy Daniels say today in court? Hey there, Weijia. Great to reconnect with you. Well, today, Stormy Daniels detailed detailed much of what we already knew, but the difference is she's saying all of this under oath in a court of law, how she met Donald Trump, how the sexual encounter came to be, how uncomfortable she was during that episode, how she was offered by Trump to appear on The Prentice, and how she subsequently, in the years that followed, feared for her safety. And that's how we got to that $130,000 um, alleged hush money payment to her for the rights of her story so that she didn't share it mm -hmm. around the 2016 election. But, Ouija, she was, in the words of, or to, to, to use my words in describing how the judge described her, she was too verbose. She spoke too quickly and said too much. And that's why Donald Trump's defense team moved for a mistrial, because they said, look, despite the contours of what she could be asked, when prosecutors asked her a question, she gave too many details and went beyond what the question was as it related to what Trump was wearing, as it related to Trump saying that he and his wife slept in separate bedrooms and that's why the affair was okay. And Judge Merchant had to tell right. her um, there were a number of objections, but he had to keep intervening and saying, you're saying too much. Now, he did not allow for there to be a mistrial, but he will limit what the jury can take from her testimony um, because he does find that most of it is useful um, and it is quite damaging to the president's, uh, former president's denial. Um, but she was a real star witness of the trial so far. But Errol, this trial is not about their intimate moments. It's not about that sexual encounter. It is about the payment um, that is alleged here and, and the fact that, you know, the question of whether Trump knew about it. So. What does the prosecution hope to get out of her testimony? That's a, a fantastic point, Ouija. This case hinges on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. And on Monday, the jury got to see the actual checks with Donald Trump's signature on them that mm. were payments from him to his lawyer, Michael Cohen, for this hush money episode. What prosecutors are trying to lay out, and we've watched this happen each week, is you have almost one star witness who's notable and recognizable and close to the case, whether it was uh, David Pecker or uh, Stormy Daniels today. And then you have um, witnesses who are more technical, people like Rona Graff, who was Trump's assistant, who could confirm that she put Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal's contact information in Trump's contact list. Today, with Stormy Daniels, you had the reverse. We had someone who confirmed, or Stormy confirmed, that her that she was able to put Donald Trump's contact information through Rona Graff into her phone. And so this isn't necessarily just about the hush money. It's about the narrative in general. Mm. And the jury just has to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Donald Trump lied on those checks to cover up this salacious alleged affair. And so that's why you see the prosecution trying to get as close to this salacious line as possible. But Judge Juan uh, Mershon kind of limiting them and pushing them back and saying the jury doesn't need to know all of the details as it relates to that alleged encounter.
that makes total sense, Earl. Thank you. And Donald Trump also posted today and then deleted a truth social post mentioning that he had just recently been told who the witness is today. How is Trump responding to the judge's threat yesterday of possible jail time for future gag order violations? Sometimes, you know, he just can't help himself. Well, Ouija, you've almost answered your question in the question, because for Donald Trump to post something to Truth Social and then delete it within 30 minutes, that's new. But it does speak to how frustrated he is, and he says as much when he enters and leaves the courtroom. In his words, this is just a conspiratorial trial from the left, when in reality there are real um, charges based on evidence and documents and testimony that everything behind me is based on. And so the fact that he posted and deleted suggests that he took Judge Merchant's threat seriously on Monday when the judge said, look, after these 10 gag order violations, the next step is to lock you up. CBS understands that they've made accommodations for that between the Secret Service, court clerks, and the NYPD, and Donald Trump is well aware. Well, you're right, Arrow. He is not somebody that typically resends anything. Thank you for all of your reporting. That's right.